morning. Today we're in chapter 2. We're looking at verses 6 through 16. I'll begin reading at verse 6. And uh, actually, do I want to do that? Yeah, I do. You know what I just did? I was looking at 2 Corinthians, and I'm thinking, why do I have that? I'm getting old. Yeah, verse 6. And I'll read verse, <laughs> verses 6 through 10, and we'll get into our study. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. As we begin our study here in chapter 2, we need to remember a few things or perhaps uh, learn a few things about Corinth and and this letter to the Corinthians, we need to remember that Corinth, the city of Corinth, Greece, was a, was a city that was filled with pride, especially had pride in human wisdom. It's been said that it was filled with the quicksand of sin, ready to draw them into shallow human philosophy. The love of human wisdom and the sinfulness of the city of Corinth was legendary. And God had spoken to the uh, Apostle Paul. God had directed him and said to him, you're going to go to the city of Corinth and you're going to minister. And so when we see him actually responding to that call, uh, as was his practice, he would first go to the synagogue because Paul said to the Jew first and then to the Greek. So he would go to the Jewish synagogue wherever it was that he went and he would first enter into the synagogue and reason with those who were there, and he'd take the gospel to those who were not Jewish. And so he went into the synagogue, and he would reason with the attendees. But as he had gone into the synagogue there in the city of Corinth, the response was angry opposition. In Acts chapter 18, it's recorded what happened. It says at verse 6, when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And so what they did is he went into the synagogue as they began to, to, uh, to blaspheme Christ. He's worthless. He's not somebody that we're going to pursue. Are you kidding me? They got very angry at the Apostle Paul. Now, the opposition in Corinth at first was greatly, greatly uh, antagonistic towards him. And he actually began to harbor some concern, even fear. You see, in Acts 18, 9, and 10, it says, The Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Do not be afraid, but speak. So he was as brave as any man could be, and yet you see, in Corinth, he had fear. That's why in chapter 2, we saw this earlier at verse 3, that's why he told the Corinthians, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And so there was a concern in the heart of the Apostle Paul because of the opposition that was filling that city and the rejection of God. These, again, were people who were enamored with human philosophy, with, with man's wisdom. It's reminiscent of what Paul said to the Colossians in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, when he said to them, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. So you're not to be yielding yourself to human philosophy, but you yield yourself to Jesus Christ. Now, for these Corinthian believers to survive, their faith had to rest in something greater than human wisdom and their own courage. Their faith had to rest in the power of God and not the wisdom of men. 
and they had to somehow confront the powers of darkness with the reality of their faith in Jesus Christ. Because as they do that, it's going to demonstrate the power of the message. And it's going to demonstrate that the message of the gospel has actually been communicated to us from heaven itself. It's like what the psalmist said in Psalm 90, verses 10 through 12. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. And this, I love this, this phrase, this, this line, teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Help us to realize that we have a limited time here on earth and to take each day into consideration, being aware that we have a temporary existence here, but we have an eternity with you, and help us to order our steps properly in order that we might have a heart of wisdom. And so the, the wisdom that we have is not going to come from human philosophy that is antagonistic to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's going to come from God himself as it's been communicated to us as a message from heaven. And that's why Paul in verse 5 had said that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The world must feel the impact of our faith, the faith of Christ, because our faith rests on Jesus and what he has accomplished on our behalf. Again, verse 2, chapter 2, he had said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so Paul had come bringing this ministry of the word of God in order that he might be able to proclaim what God has done for us through Jesus. Psalm 60, verse 12, with God we will gain the victory and he will trample down our enemies. And so that's what happens through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This victory comes through Jesus triumphing over the enemy and he did so when he conquered the grave. And we have victory in him because of that. It's been said Jesus left an empty tomb in order to fill our empty lives. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul could say in verses 55 through 57, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in 1 John 5, 4, John said it like this, Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And so we're overcomers through the one who has loved us and has given us the power to overcome. So the heart of our message will always be Jesus Christ and him crucified. And the pro proclamation of the message is with the intent for God to receive all the glory. Even as we saw in chapter 1, the last verse, verse 31 uh, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. So God gets all the glory. We preach a message of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the message that saves man. And we make sure that Jesus stays central. Again, 2 Corinthians 4, 5, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. So Paul is making it very clear. Our faith is not to be in the wisdom of men. Now, as we begin, that was all an introduction. As we begin, he is not saying the gospel is without wisdom. He is saying that the gospel is past human wisdom, is past human beings finding out unaided. In the book of Job, chapter 11, verses 7 and 8, one of the so-called friends of Job, a man by the name of Zophar, said this, he said, can you, by searching, find out God? Can you find out the Almighty to perfection? It is as high as heaven. What can you do? Deeper than hell, what can you know? It is the height of human arrogance to think that we, without help, could find God. It is God who finds us. All the way back in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. And God had given the command not to touch that forbidden fruit. And uh, a man had succumbed to the temptation to do so, as we know the story. And after doing so, we see evidence of man hiding from God in the garden. And God actually is the one who breaks into human history by calling out to Adam. 
It isn't Adam who, after failing, called out to God. It is God who calls out to Adam and asks the question, where are you? And from the Bible's first chapter to the last, the spirit and the bride, the last chapter, say, come, there's an invitation. It's God from the beginning saying, Adam, where are you? And then concluding his book by saying, come. There's this call from God to lost man. But we cannot search out God and discover him unaided. There's no way that I have the capacity to understand him. You see, if I could understand God unaided, then I would have to be God myself. You cannot find out God without God allowing you to discover him. It's one of those incredible cosmic games of hide and seek. If he decides to hide, you're never going to find him. He's not like me when I used to play hide and seek with my kids when they were small, where I would hide in some place where they'd discover me eventually. You know, I always hid in the same place. All they had to do is look for me once and they'd find me every other time. It was always in bed under the blankets. That's where I would hide. And yet, there we, they would go all through the house looking for me and looking for me and they couldn't find me. And I always made sure to, to play hide and go seek in the dark. It would always scare them a little bit more. It was quite fun. And they would come looking, and I always hid on the bunk bed on the top in the corner with some pillows around me and a blanket over me. Always did the same exact place. And I can still remember hearing them come into that room. It was the last place they'd look because they knew that they were going to find me in there eventually. And then I could hear them climbing up the ladder of that bunk bed, and I would be looking, and I could see just the top of David's head when his little... He just, you'd just see his little head and his eyes would be looking right at where he knew where I was. And I would sit there quietly until his little face popped over and then I'd jump out. Oh, you know, it was a lot of fun. He'd go flying off, you know, and he'd <laughs> smash everything. It was great. But you know what? I mean, these, they were little kids. They were three years old, four years old. You know, if I really wanted to hide from them, all I had to do was go outside. They couldn't go outside. They'd have never found me. If God decides to hide from you, do you think you can find him? No, of course not. That's the whole point. God does hide himself, but he also, he also manifests himself. You see, if God didn't choose to reveal himself to man, we'd never come to know him. Isaiah 45, 15. Truly, you are a God who hides yourself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Unless God answers the sin question, sin that makes separation between man and himself, man is doomed to be forever lost. Doomed to be forever lost. Man cannot find out God. God reveals himself to man. Romans 11, 33, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Unless the Lord reveals himself, man will never know him. Man didn't invent the gospel. And because man did not invent this gospel message, our faith doesn't rest on man's ingenuity. Our faith rests in God's power to save, a power to save that was displayed when Jesus died on the cross when Jesus was buried and Jesus was resurrected. And that's how his wisdom is demonstrated through salvation. And so Paul has been speaking concerning that. And that's why in verse 6 he goes on to say, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are, he says, coming to nothing. We're not giving you the wisdom of this period of time, the wisdom of this age. We're not giving you natural wisdom. We're not giving you a wisdom that, that comes from a, a mind that hasn't been illuminated by the Spirit of God. Because the end results of human wisdom will always be hollow emptiness. True wisdom comes from God. And true wisdom is actually found in Jesus Christ. Like it says in Colossians 2, 3, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so... Paul's exhortation to the church of Corinth, as well as through the entire history of the, the life of the church, is simply this. The church is to rest in the wisdom and power of God. 
And we need to resist the temptation to find wisdom in any other source. The wisdom that we have is actually found in Jesus Christ and is revealed to us in the word of God. In chapter 1 here in 1 Corinthians, remember with me verse 24. How he says in chapter 1 verse 24, To those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Well, the fact is we're supposed to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he is to us. And so we've been called to, to, to rest in that wisdom. But he also, notice in verse 6, speaks of, of uh, states that he is speaking wisdom among those who are, and this is interesting, who are mature. He's speaking to those who are saved. He's, now, this is interesting because the Corinthian church, when you read Corinthians, you see they had so many problems. It's interesting to note that Paul is actually saying, but you haven't come behind in any gift. You do have an actual relationship with Jesus Christ. It's just getting muddled right now. And so as he's speaking and bringing correction, the fact is he's speaking to people who have an, a, a spiritual discernment. He's speaking to those who are saved. You see, the unsaved don't see the wisdom that's in the word of God. The unsaved do not see the wisdom that's found in the message of salvation. To, to the unsaved, the Bible is a closed book that's filled with stories for children. For, it has myths and it has, has just fantastic things about devils and, and trees with certain kinds of fruit and, and someone who says he was dead, they say he was dead, but now he's alive. And that's how the world looks at Christianity. It doesn't make any sense. But for those of us who believe, we see it as the wisdom of God and the power of God disclosed to us here in the word of God. And that's what Paul is speaking about. It's a wisdom that he's speaking amongst those who have spiritual discernment. Again, in verse 7, notice how he says, we speak the wisdom of God, a wisdom that originates with God is what he's saying, in a mystery. When you look at the word mystery, the word mystery is interesting because for us, here in the 21st century and for the longest time, the word mystery, if you use the word mystery, like I'm reading a mystery book or I saw a movie that was a mystery, for us the word mystery speaks of something that is hidden from us. It's a mystery. But the New Testament use of the word mystery is, is a secret that at one time had been hidden, but is now disclosed. So a mystery in the New Testament sense is, is, is a secret that has now been revealed. And he's saying, we have something that was mysterious at one time that has now been opened up for you to understand. And so we're speaking the wisdom, he said, of God in a mystery. Again, this is a mystery that needs to be revealed and has been through the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this mystery is disclosed to people. And that's why a lot of people have a problem with this one. Because they say it's so simplistic. The mystery is revealed through just a proclamation of a message called the gospel. When you stand up and you say, guess what? There's a God. And this God loves you. And this God has a son. And this son's name is Jesus. And Jesus, God's son, was born of a virgin. And he dwelt amongst men for 33 years. And then ultimately was betrayed by a close associate, placed on a cross as the um, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, laid his life down voluntarily, poured out every drop of his blood, died saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do dismissed his spirit, was taken off of a cross, placed in a borrowed tomb, remained there for three days, and then lo and behold, during that day, the first witnesses were women who were not valid witnesses in a Jewish court of law, and yet God says, I am going to validate women by having them as the very first witnesses of the resurrection. So Mary and the other women who are there at the tomb are the very first to ever say, he's alive, he's risen, and so what he's doing right there is breaking the taboos amongst that culture, saying you can have a declaration that is official and recognized through these women. And they see the fact that Jesus Christ is alive, and he remains on earth ministering for many days, and ultimately he ascends into heaven, and his disciples are standing there on the Mount of Olives as he ascends, and they watch him, and they're so dumbfounded as the clouds receive him, that angels have to appear and say, men of Israel, what are you doing standing around? Didn't you hear what he said? Go out and tell people about the gospel. And to us, that makes, well, to me at least, and I'm sure most everyone of us, that makes perfect sense. That's the gospel. 
That's what he did. I didn't invent it. You didn't invent it. Human beings didn't originate this. This came from God himself. This is the mystery of God revealed to man. It's called the gospel. And guess what? Believing that message, believing that message that God loves and God forgives can absolutely, with the power of the Spirit in your life, absolutely transform your life to be unrecognizable to those who knew you best. Speaking to one of our brothers in our fellowship today after church, he's been with us a long time. He said, I, he said, you can share this if you want. I think he just wants his name mentioned. <laughs> He's a good brother. He serves here, and I love him. Fernando. He said, Pastor, he said, I don't, I don't know if you know this. He says, I came to church here years ago now, years ago. He said, and I went to what is called the Lion Tamers. He said, I went to Lion Tamers when it used to be not on this property, but in Ontario. He said, and when I went to Lion Tamers, he said, I heard what they had to say. He said, but I, I, just, I just didn't grab hold of it. He said, and I was into drugs. He said, I got arrested, and I spent five years, five years in prison in Corcoran. And I said, Corcoran, huh? He goes, yeah. I said, I got relatives in Corcoran, not the prison. <laughs> well, maybe in the prison, I don't know, but probably. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, I said, I've got relatives. I used to go to Corcoran as a little boy, and we'd be in and speak. He said, he said, well, I wanted to tell you that so I could tell you this. He said, for five years, I did my time, five years in Corcoran. He goes, I received weekly tapes from the ministry here. He said, I wanted you to know that you have prison ministry in Corcoran. You just didn't know it. He says, because all the tapes that I received, I donated to the prison library. And he said, and it's just an amazing thing. He says that your, 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 your ministry is there in the Corcoran prison. He goes, but, he said, can you imagine? He said, I did my time. I grew in the Lord by listening to, to, to tapes. He says, can you imagine? He says, and now I am the leader over the lion tamer ministry here. He's the one who leads our lion tamers. And so that's what God does. God grabs hold of a guy who came to the lion tamers because he was a druggie. And the guy didn't really care very much what was being said, continued in his drugs, gets arrested, spends five years in prison, comes out, but he comes out five years of Bible studies. He used to teach Bible studies in prison. He comes out, and he's been for years leading our lion tamer ministry here seeing God deliver people, all because he actually believes. He actually believes that God exists. He actually believes that God loves. He actually believes that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. He believes the Holy Spirit can enter a person's life and transform them from the inside out. He believes all of that, and he's a testimony, as all of us in this room who love Jesus Christ are. We all have testimonies, every one. I don't encourage you to go out and get arrested, spend five times, unless you want to start a prison ministry in Alcatraz. That's fine with me. I'll send you tapes. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. This message, this message of love, this message of transformation, wisdom that has been hidden so that the natural philosophic mind is not going to be able to receive it. It makes no sense to him. So he says, we're speaking wisdom amongst those who are mature. And this wisdom, well, we speak it, this wisdom of God in a mystery. A and the result of believing this message, he said, it results in our glory. In Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Romans 8, 29 continuing says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. 
This message results in our glory. 1 John 3, 2 and 3, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So God produces lives that bring glory to him. Notice verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew. None of the rulers of this age knew that God would give his son for the ransom of human souls because in their eyes, Jesus was only useful for death. But he goes on in verse 9, but as is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. God. It's interesting, as he gives us verse 9, uh, Paul is actually giving us three scriptures. Isaiah 64, verse 4, Isaiah 65, verse 17, as well as Isaiah 52, verse 15. He mixes these three scriptures, and, uh, and he's giving to us some insight. Now, when I first read this, <clears throat> I, I thought that what he was referring to was heaven, and I guess the average person upon reading that might think the same thing. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So at first, reading it, I, saw, I thought within myself, well, it's, well, yeah. We don't have a, a, an idea of how glorious heaven's going to be. But in reality, uh, that's not exactly what he's saying. This doesn't seem to be a picture of heaven. No, in context, it has to be that it's referring to the natural man who doesn't understand God's ways in the life of a believer. Because see, God has already put eternity into our hearts. We already have this sense that Jesus has prepared a place for us and we're in that direction. We're moving in that direction already. <laughs> so we already know the Lord is gonna do something to us and what it's gonna be within us is it's gonna give us the joy of knowing where, we're, where our final destination is. So what he's trying to say here to us or what he is saying and we're trying to understand is God's wisdom is only comprehended by those who love him. The eye and the ear are natural means of obtaining information. The heart speaks of the mind to a Hebrew. And so what he's saying is unregenerated rational thought will never, never fathom God's ways. That's why we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not into our own understanding. That's why in all our ways we acknowledge him and he directs our path. We, I, I'm, I'm glad to be speaking to a group of people who appreciate what I'm saying about this when I say you can just never argue somebody into the kingdom of God. You just can't. I, I've tried. I have tried. I tried a long time and a lot of times. Argued with a lot of people. Tried to argue them into the kingdom of God. He discovered something, guys, that you have too. If you can argue them in, someone can argue them out. If I can give a logical case as to why the things I believe are right and true and you should embrace, there's somebody who can come and contradict that argument. But one thing I have discovered about God is when he convinces you, no man can convince you otherwise. No man can convince you otherwise. You can come up to me and you can argue with me all day long and, you, and I, I'm, not, I'm not the smartest, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in, 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 you know, in the drawer, that's for sure. But I do know one thing for sure, God doesn't lie. I have, a, I have a, a real strong belief that he didn't lie. I may not be able to fathom him, and I can't, and, and unless he reveals more to me, I'll never will. And this side of heaven, I won't understand completely. On the other side, yes, then I shall know even as I'm known. But there's one thing I do know for sure, and that is that God's word is true. God's Holy Spirit brings conviction. God transforms human lives. And God has done that through his word in my life, which has given to me a great strength of belief that really can't be shaken. In other words, there's just no way that somebody would ever come up and argue me out of, out of the kingdom of God. Why? It isn't because somebody argued me into it. It's because God's word and God's Holy Spirit convinced me of its truth. And God keeps those that belong to him. And no man can take them out of his hand. 
And so the Lord has grabbed hold of my heart. And that's why when you have that kind of sense, when you say, nope, there's no doubt about it, I don't understand everything about God, so the best thing I do is hold on to the things that I do understand. I hold fast to the things I do understand and the things I don't understand. It's put in a little box in my mind that is, you know, to be looked at later. And, and if I have to address those things later, I will. And I've had all kinds of questions over 41 years. Lord, may I speak to you about your judgments? I want to ask you why you do this. And the Lord has said, uh, you know, to be continued. This is a conversation you don't really need to engage me in. And I'm not going to give you an answer that satisfies you at the moment because you're not ready. So why don't you just put this aside for a little while and let's deal with what you do know. What are the things that you do know? Well, I do know that the Bible says that God loves me. Okay, then why don't you hold fast to my love and trust me in the rest? All right, that makes sense to me. And that's what I've done for 41 years. Trusted that he loves me and everything else has worked its, its way out. When you know that God loves you, then you're secure. When you know he cares about you, you're secure. You may not understand everything that's going around you, but guess what? Some things are to be answered later. Some things may never be answered this side of heaven. So I hold fast to what I understand, and I leave the mysteries in his hand. If he wants to reveal to me the answer, I bless him for it. So I trust him with, my own, with all my heart, and I don't lean onto my own understanding. I do acknowledge him in all my ways, and he directs me. So these things that God has prepared are prepared for us because we're his children. That's what he says in verse 10. Notice, God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So these things are revealed not to the unbeliever, but to the believer, to whatever degree that we can receive them, and as our maturity continues to increase. But he reveals these things to us by his spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit who communicates his truth to us. Jesus in John 14, 26 said it like this. He said, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So it's the Holy Spirit who brings the word to us. It's the Holy Spirit who gives to us insight, and he reveals to us by his spirit these things. Now, verse 12, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You can go to school and you can take classes, the class that you would see in your syllabus as you were signing up for Bible classes would be homiletics. All of us have heard that term. If you're not, the word homiletics just teaches you how to preach. So if you wanna to learn to be a preacher, you take a class called homiletics, right? And as you take the class called homiletics, they will teach you how to do your outlines. They will teach you how to prepare a Bible study. They will give you an opportunity in this homiletical class to stand up in front of the class and give a 10 minute or 15 minute devotion. The students will all be seated in there with their notebooks open and their pens out correcting you. Once you've given your message, they'll all kind of respond and say, well, you know, I thought your illustration was good, uh, but you were real weak on your exegesis, and that's what they do in your homiletics class. And afterwards, you can become a polished speaker. You can learn how to communicate. And uh, you can go out, and now you've got your little degree, and it says, Master of Homiletics. I'm a great preacher. But start a Bible study and see if people come and listen to you. Because some people, can speak, you know, the paint off a wall. They're very good, but there's no anointing there. There's a lot of Im information, and I appreciate it, but there's no passion there. There's a lot of stuff that's being said, but there's no love there. And, and people will come and listen and say, well, that's interesting, but if I want information, I'll read the same books. There's got to be something deeper than that. And that comes by the Spirit of God. In the early days of Calvary Chapel Ministries, people used to look at Pastor Chuck and used to say, oh, he's a simple-minded man leading simple-minded men. 
and his messages are so simple. And, and they thought they were insulting pastor. And he said, that's exactly what I want. I want the message to be understood by every person inside that room. We were taught this, put the cookies on the shelf where the children can reach them. It, 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 it's not like, it's not like, like, like we're so brilliant, but God knows we're not. And it, I hope it doesn't come off that way because uh, look at Roll and you get my point. I, I, I'm <laughs> You know, people tell them what I say. You know that, don't you? <laughs> I used to teach a home Bible study. That's where I started to learn to teach. I was 23 years old. My dad um, went to eighth grade and quit school in the eighth grade, which was common, by the way, when he was growing up. And because he came from a family of uh, 12 children, he started working at the age of 13. At the age of 17, he went into the US Navy and served honorably on the USS Pennsylvania during World War II. He got out of the Navy and he met this young woman at a dance, I believe in Montebello, East LA. He spoke Spanish, not knowing that she was a Mexican gal. And he said, ooh, she's a cute little thing. And this cute little thing answered in Spanish back, well, thanks, handsome. <laughs> and within a few months, he married this little girl. She was one month past her 17th birthday. My dad was 20. My mom was 17. They got married. Dad worked as a truck driver until the day he retired took an early retirement to care for my mom, who wasn't well. Well, he had four children, three ugly ones and me. <laughs> and Dad liked to read. He read every night. He read the Reader's Digest. There was a Reader's Digest by his bed, and I would come in occasionally and dad would be reading his Reader's Digest. He liked to read. Um, but dad, like I said, was an eighth grade you know, graduate. That was it. That was his senior year. And uh, now his son gets saved. Now I'm going to college and I'm learning to increase my vocabulary. And I'm getting challenged by professors uh, in issues related to theology and things, and I'm starting to grow, and I'm starting a Bible study, and now I'm giving a Bible study, and my dad and my mom are sitting there along with some neighbors, and my dad would just smile and beam at me when I taught, and one day the Holy Spirit said, your dad is very proud of you, but you're using words that he's never, never learned. So what are you doing, and who are you impressing? I've never forgotten that. Again, I need to hasten to say this. My father was a very intelligent man. My dad was not unintelligent. My dad was just not educated beyond the eighth grade. And so I learned a long time ago, as all of us have in this room, that we ought to keep the word of God as simple and plain as is possible so that people are not impressed with us, but impressed with him so that they actually walk out of a Bible study saying, I've learned something about God that I needed to know. That's what Bible studies are intended to do. It's not difficult, guys, at all to, to say impressive things. It's not hard. Anybody who's been teaching for a while can structure, throw in some Greek, throw in some history, throw in all kinds of things that is very impressive. My heart has always been, but when you walk out of the room, do you love Jesus more? Do you know him better? That's the key. And so the Lord actually gives to us his word, his spirit, in order that we might be able to communicate these things to man and understand that it's the Holy Spirit who brings these things to us, that we might know those things that have been freely given to us. We can't find God's ways out on our own. God reveals his ways. It's like it says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, 
So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so what he wants us to know is what has been freely given to us. Again, Romans 8, 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God gave me his son, what's he going to hold back from me? What's he going to hold back from me? If he gave his son, his son, what is he going to hold back from me? Nothing. Because what is more valuable in heaven's treasury than the son of God? Nothing. And so I should know that my God loves me. He gave his son for me and will not hold anything back. Well, in verse 13, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches us, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? We have the mind of Christ. The natural man, that's the title of this message. The term natural man speaks of the unspiritual or the unregenerate man. The man or woman is just a generic term meaning human being. The individual who has never been born again is called in scripture the natural man. But when you take that scripture apart, it says, the natural man receiveth not. I memorized it in the King James. It's easier to come off that way. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. That word receives or receiveth means the natural man, the unspiritual man, the unregenerated man, the man who has not been born again does not welcome. That word receive is a Greek word that speaks of welcoming, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. It's a picture of the spirit will say knocking on a door and a natural man looking through a window at will say the spirit Jesus will say standing at that door knocking and he's in the house not wanting to open the door to allow Christ access the natural man receives not the things of the spirit of God the natural man does not welcome in the things of the Holy Spirit. Why? They are foolishness to him. That word foolish is, is the root word where we use the English word moronic. We also use the word imbecilic. The natural man, the unspiritual man, the person who's never been born again, does not welcome in the things of the Spirit of God because they're stupid to him. It makes no sense. And so that's the man who will look at you when you get saved and say, why'd you do that? Well, didn't you grow up going to the church? Why'd you do that? Listen, I went to church as a little boy, yes. I went through the things of my church that, that were supposed to make me a full citizen in the church. I received the baptism, I received the communion, I received the confirmation, yes, I did that. I did all of those things. But I was still a natural man. Because the water baptism didn't save me. Because the Bible teaches it's not the washing of the flesh, but it's the renewing of the mind. The Bible never teaches that water itself is what God uses to cleanse the human soul. The Bible teaches it's the blood of Christ that cleanses the soul. And so water doesn't save you. And so though I was four months old, getting water baptized in a small church in Los Angeles, I was still an unregenerate baby growing up into an unregenerate little boy who went to my catechism class, who got my first communion. And then later on, I was an unregenerate, you know, middle schooler, junior higher, receiving my confirmation, taking my confirmation name, getting slapped on the face by the bishop and the whole nine yards, learning to turn the other cheek and all that we were taught. And I am unregenerate. And at 15, when I have the opportunity to start drinking, I do. I start taking my drugs a little later, and then for the next few years, that's my life. Yet you argue with me and say to me, I'm not a Christian. I would say I was baptized. I was 
I, I received communion, and I've been confirmed. I'm recognized as an adult in the church. I just haven't been to the sacrament of confession for a while, haven't done my penance. But the bottom line is, is I am a member of the true and original, the first church, and I knew my catechism well enough, even as a drunk and a druggie, to argue. Like many of you, I did not know Jesus Christ. And so when my friends would tell me that Jesus could save me and Jesus loved me, I, with a flick of the wrist, I would say, are you kidding me? I already know. I was raised in the church. You weren't. And you're coming to tell me about God? What do you know about God? And that was my argumentative spirit because I was fully convinced that what I had received was true. I just not, had not really put it into practice. Can you imagine how when the Holy Spirit, that day, December 27, 1970, when the Holy Spirit grabbed my attention and said, you are not saved, how surprised I was that day. I was literally surprised by God because I thought I was a Christian. I just wasn't practicing my faith. But the Holy Spirit's conviction in my life was a question. And he said, you're uncomfortable. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, why? And I said, because I'm not like these people. And he said, and what is making the difference between you and them? And for the first time that I can remember ever admitting it to the Lord who is prompting my heart, I said, because I'm not a Christian. That was the first time that I ever admitted I wasn't a Christian because I would have argued hammer and tong that I was all the way up to that Maranatha concert. I would have said, I am a Christian. I'm just not doing what I'm supposed to do right now. But when I got there, that's the Holy Spirit, you see? The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. Neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. It's the Holy Spirit who does the work within you. The natural man, these things are foolish. Are you kidding me? What are you guys doing on Sunday night at church? The natural man, are you kidding me? You serve over there in that cult? Are you crazy? That's the natural man. They don't understand. They don't understand. Why don't you do what you used to do? You were a lot of fun. You were a lot of fun. My cousin said that to me. My cousin Ray. David, what happened to you, man? You were a lot of fun. He said, now you've changed. What happened to you? I said, I was fun because I was a fool. I acted the fool. I was a fool. I made you laugh because when I drank, I'd be stupid and do stupid things. I was your clown. I said, but guess what now? I'm not your clown. Now I'm saved. My life has changed. I have purpose. God has forgiven me. I'm new. And that is what God does through salvation. And it didn't come through my baptism as a baby. It didn't come through memorizing the Ten Commandments and getting the little gold and silver stars on my catechism. It didn't come when I got my confirmation name and I changed, I gave my name Richard because I liked Richard. I wanted, to be, I wanted to be Ricky Rosales. That's true. <laughs> I even put that on my social security card. When I went into the military, I gave myself a middle name, David Richard Rosales. That's on my military record. I don't have a middle name. My mom was all mad at me. She says, you don't have a middle name. I say, I do, I'm Richard. No, you're not. The natural man. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. You can... Uh, you live a life that the world, if they don't know Christ, just cannot relate to. But God reveals to us and to the body of Christ things that we all unite on. He who has known the mind of the Lord, who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, we have the mind of Christ. Well, what has happened is God has given to us a new mind. Somebody once said, you're brainwashed. <laughs> brainwashed. Someone answered that, yeah. My brains were dirty, and they needed a good washing, and they've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So absolutely, they're brainwashed. I am brainwashed by the blood. Yes, yeah, yeah. God gives to us newness of life, and he does so through the Lord 
Jesus Christ. And I don't instruct him. You know, when's the last time God ever called you up and asked for some advice? <laughs> but he instructs me. And he does that through the word, the word of God that reveals his mind to us. The natural man doesn't understand that. But the one with the spirit of God most certainly does.